Welcome to lecture number 15 for ECE 461 control systems, mass and spring systems, and the wave equation. Now, what we looked at in our last lecture was a the heat equation, RC filters. With RC filters, you get real poles. And if I have four or four capacitors, I've got a fourth order differential equation. Today we're going to look at mass spring systems, more mechanical systems. In this case, We've got force is mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the second derivative of position. So what you wind up with is each mass gives you two states. So if I have 10 masses in the system, I actually have a 20th order system, with the two end states being the kinetic energy of each mass and the potential energy. Now the approach that we're going to take, uh, when you take physics, you do free body diagrams. Um, here we're going to do it a little bit differently. Being electrical engineers, uh, we kind of like circuits a little bit better than free body diagrams. So what we're going to do in this class is take the mass spring system and replace it with a circuit equivalent. Uh, once you get the circuit equivalent, I can write the node equations. And that t tends to work better for electrical engineers, uh, maybe not so well for mechanical engineers, but being electricals, that's the approach we'll take. So starting out, for a uh, mass spring system, I need to find the electrical analog for the mass spring and friction. In the mechanical world, you've got force is mass times acceleration, or actually force is mass times the second derivative of position. In the electrical world, you've got current is admittance times voltage. So if you do the analogy, current is force, voltage is position, the mass times second derivative is the admittance. So doing that analogy, what you wind up with is, if I have a, a mass, here's the symbol for mass. The admittance then would be mass times the second derivative, or ms squared. If I have a spring, the way a spring works is if I take a spring and stretch it, it tries to pull me back, and the force is proportional to the stretch. So force is proportional to displacement. Uh, doing the analogy of current is admittance times voltage, the admittance is then K. For friction, friction is like you take your hands, rub them together. If you're not moving, there's no friction. It's the relative motion that causes the force, causes the heat. For friction, force is your friction times velocity. And doing the analogy of force is admittance times position, it's B times the derivative, or F sub V times the derivative. So that'd be the admittance. And the thing to note, these are admittance, not impedances. Admittances and impedances are different. Uh, B equals IR, resistances add in series. Admittances are 1 over R. Admittances add in parallel. So there is a difference. No one else in the world knows the difference, but electrical engineers do. So, uh, suppose I have this mass spring system, and I want to find the dynamics. Find the transfer function from force to X2. Now, back in physics, you do your free body diagrams, and it's not really clear if I have these springs K1 and K2, do K1 and K2 add or subtract? Again, it's not really obvious from the free body diagram. A lot of times you get sign errors. If you draw the circuit equivalent, it actually works out a little bit cleaner. So, to draw the circuit equivalent, first thing you do is draw your ground reference. Um, here I didn't label the ground, I forgot to connect it, but that bottom line is ground. The ground is the non-accelerating reference frame. That actually relates to Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, if you're on the planet Earth, it feels like we're stationary. That's because we're in a, a valid reference frame, a non-accelerating reference frame, or effectively not accelerating. So I could treat Earth as my ground reference, my zero position. Somebody on the moon could treat the moon as a zero position. If you're on the Earth moving in a train, that could be your zero position. Any non-accelerating reference frame is a valid reference frame. And there's kind of a story behind that. This goes back to Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein actually got the Nobel Prize in 1903 for showing that light was an electromagnetic phenomenon. A photon can travel in a vacuum. It doesn't need ether. It doesn't need anything else. It's an electromagnetic field that is self-perpetuating. So since light travels in a vacuum, uh, here's a question for you. How fast does light travel? And the only answer is light travels at the speed of light. It doesn't know, it doesn't care if the rest of the universe existed. If there was nothing else in the universe, 
light would still travel. What that means is the speed of light doesn't depend on anything else. The speed of light is a constant. So if the speed of light is a constant, uh, what happens if you're in a spaceship traveling at half the speed of light and you're turning your headlights on? If the speed of light is a constant, that means that time is variable. If I travel faster and faster, speed, which is distance over time, is a constant. The photon being emitted relative to me isn't going as fast because I'm going half the speed of light. But the speed of light is a constant, meaning time has to slow down too, so that the distance over time remains constant. So that's where you get the theory of relativity. Time slows down as you go faster. Uh, light is constant. Time is not. That's got quite a few implications. That means that you cannot have a world supercomputer where all the clocks are synchronized because on the equator, the Earth is spinning faster than we are up here in Fargo, North Dakota. So time actually goes a little bit slower at the equator than it does here. If you had two computers completely synchronized at one point, very shortly they would no longer be synchronized because time slower at the equator. If you hop on an airplane and fly to London and back, you're going to be a little bit younger than your identical twin. In fact, if you flew back and forth to London your entire life, you would live about 15 milliseconds longer than your identical twin. Each flight, you gain about 4 nanoseconds, which isn't a whole lot, but if you're running a 4 gigahertz Pentium chip, that's 4 clocks. Uh, so, um, that means you can't have synchronized computers. That means the internet, the web, has to be asynchronous. asynchronous. That's one implication of the theory of relativity. What that also means is that if I have a mass, its inertia is relative to a non-accelerating non reference frame. I could take the inertia relative to the Earth, and it's fine. Take the inertia relative to a car moving on the Earth, and that's a perfectly valid reference frame. I could have somebody on the moon treat the moon as a reference frame. That's all valid. That's relativity. The inertia is always relative to a non-accelerating reference frame. Take your pick what you want that to be. And on the Earth, we can't tell that we're moving, even though it seems like we are. On the Moon, you couldn't tell that you're moving, even though from the Earth it looks like the Moon definitely is moving, and so on. So inertia is always relative to ground, relative to non-accelerating reference frame. If you ever draw a block diagram, mass in parallel with mass, actually mass in series with mass, what you're saying is that the acceleration is relative to a different mass's position. And that's not the case. Mass 1 doesn't know, it doesn't care. If mass 2 exists, it has inertia regardless. Mass 2 doesn't know or care if mass 1 exists. It has inertia regardless. So the inertia is always relative to ground. And if you ever draw inertia relative to another mass, but two masses in series, you're violating Einstein's theory of relativity. So again, masses go to ground. Uh, back at the ranch, now that I have my two masses and my two voltage nodes, add everything else. I've got a spring going between the mass and ground, there's K1. I've got friction between V1 and ground. As mass 1 moves back and forth, there's friction on the ground. So here's your friction going between X1 and ground. I've got friction between mass 1 and mass 2. I've got a spring going between mass 1 and mass 2. Friction mass 2 to ground, spring between mass 2 and ground, and then a force. A force is a current source. Uh, for whether the arrow goes up or down, you got a 50-50 shot. What I like doing is guess. Uh, what this current source says is that if the force is positive, it raises the voltage on, on X1 up here in the mass spring system. If the force is positive, it tries to increase the displacement on X1. That's consistent. If it's consistent, I got it right. Otherwise, just flip the sign of the arrow. So that's the first step. Draw the circuit equivalent. Next, uh, write your node equations. And again, the bottom part is ground. I forgot to draw on the ground symbol. When you write the no your node equations, it's going to be, uh, let's see, since these are mittances, the current from the node equals zero. So this is minus F, bring it right as plus F, uh, plus X1 times K1. And this is an admittance. You multiply by admittances, divide by resistance. So it's X1 times K1 plus X1 times SB1 plus X1 times M1S squared uh, plus X1 minus X2 times these guys. A shortcut is the net result is it's all the admittances attached to X1. That's these guys times X1 minus the admittances between X1 and X2. 
The way that comes from is you have your x1 minus x2 times the admittances. So there's the minus x2. All that has to add up to the current to the node. At node 2, all the admittances attached to the node times x2 minus the admittances between nodes 2 and 1 times x1 is the current to the node. That's your node equation. And now going back, we were asking what does k1 and k2 do those add or subtract? And here you can see pretty clearly they add. And that actually kind of makes sense. If they add, k1 it has to be positive. It's hard to build negative springs. They produce energy. If they add, if I add positive numbers, I'm always positive. If I subtracted, say it was k1 minus k2, I would just make k2 bigger than k1, and now I've got a negative spring. I'm producing energy. Um, that can't happen, so it can't be subtracted. It's got to be add. And the circuit equations kind of make it clear they add. Once you get your equations, I can then find the transfer function. And to do that, we use state space. Uh, note, I've got the second derivative. So when I solve for the highest derivative, I get s squared x1. That'll be a function of x1 and sx1. So my states are both position and velocity. That's your potential energy, kinetic energy. The derivative of position is velocity. So that's where you get the zero identity matrix. The derivative of the first two states are the second two states. Position goes to velocity. The second two states are where the dynamics come into play. So s squared x1, this guy, is your springs minus k1 plus k2 over m1. Uh, the friction terms, minus b1 plus b3 over m1 times sx1, the derivative, third state. Uh, let's see, plus k2 over m1, x, m1, plus b3 over m1 times sx2, plus 1 over m times f. That's the third equation, and the fourth one comes down here. So again, notice that I have two masses, gives me a fourth order system. If I want to know what's the position of the second mass of those four states, I pick off the second one. Um, note that for RC filters, I had to have real roots. Mass spring systems, I can have complex roots. For example, I could have a mass and a spring with no friction. It's just going to bounce up and down. That means I've got a complex root. Uh, to find the transfer function to x2, what I would do is take the resulting A matrix, B matrix, throw it in MATLAB, pick off the second state, that's x2, there is no D matrix, throw it in MATLAB, find the transfer function, and voila, there's the transfer function from force to x2. And if you want to do the dominant pole, I've got two sets of poles. This one is the slowest, not a whole lot slower, but a little bit slower. So that'd be the dominant pole-ish. Not real dominant, give it somewhat dominant. If I use a second order approximation, keep the same dominant pole, keep the same DC gain, I would get this as my second order approximation. The second order approximation gives me the red curve. The actual is a blue. Um, it's not bad, but again, that fast pole isn't that much faster. So it's really more like a fourth order system. Uh, some more fun stuff. So that's kind of the general case for a mass spring system. Each mass is a voltage node. If I have n nodes, I'm going to have two n states. Let's take a mass spring system if I cascade them. If I do that, what I wind up with is a couple second order differential equations where the second derivative is the function of the node i and the two neighbors. That's just like the heat equation like we had yesterday, except that instead of being the first derivative, it's now the second derivative. That gives you the wave equation. Similar, but completely different. And to see that, um, let's suppose I had a 30 node system. That gives me a 60th order differential equation. Each node has got two energy states, potential energy, kinetic energy. Gives you two n states or 60th order system. Let's see how that behaves. So we have got the program wave, and as I run it, We'll let it go and talk about it. What I have here is the same thing I had for the heat equation. I've got your 10 minus 20, 10 for each node, except that's the second derivative. To get the position, integrate the second derivative, I get first derivative, velocity. 
integrate velocity, I get position. So this is just like the heat equation, but I now have to integrate twice rather than once. That gives me a completely different response. If I launch a wave on the left, what happens is that launches a wave, has the name of wave equation, that propagates down the system. When I hit a discontinuity, like the endpoint, here this is a free endpoint, I get a plus reflection. When I hit the left endpoint, that point is fixed. A fixed point gives you a negative reflection. Comes in negative, reflects positive. That's how a wave equation behaves. Uh, completely different than the heat equation. And the only difference between the two is I've got coupled differential equations, but now these are coupled second order differential equations rather than first order. That slight difference gives you a completely different response and actually makes this really, really hard to control and kind of fun to watch. Again, MATLAB isn't really designed for animation, but it does a really good job. Uh, let's start that off again. So again, I'm going to start out at rest. I'm going to snap the left endpoint that launches a wave. On the heat equation, that would be about all that happens. It just kind of settles out. Wave equation, the wave contains the energy. I launch the wave, the energy goes down the beam, hits the right endpoint, and reflects. Comes back to the left endpoint, the fixed endpoint, and get a negative reflection. Okay, it looks very, very similar, but the wave equation is much, much different than the heat equation. So you get those reflections. This also makes it just an absolute bear to control. Uh, second order systems don't really work for the wave equations. If you look at the eigenvalues, I've got a 60th order system. I've got 60 poles. Turns out all 60 poles are right on the j mega axis. So all 60 of them are dominant. So second order approximations are not going to work real well. It's going to make it really hard to control the system as well. Instead of just trying to take one pole and pulling it left, Again, left is stable, right is unstable, left decays as e to the minus 5t, right half plane decays as e to the plus 5t, blows up. To stabilize it, I want to pull all these poles left. That's hard to do when i got 60 of them to play with. So, again, the heat equation is fairly easy to control. Wave equation is just a bear. And the only difference is coupled first order differential equations or coupled second order differential equations. So that's kind of the idea behind the mass spring systems and the wave equation. Only difference is I have coupled second order differential equations. And the way you model this in MATLAB is to get two end states. Half the states are position and they're derivative. And you get this kind of matrix. The zero identity, derivative of positions, velocity, and there's the acceleration. That's lecture number 15 for ECE 461 control systems, mass spring systems, and the wave equation.